For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. And the fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the city's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. Excuse me. I need to clean the room. It was 1946, and the Second World War was over. Most of Europe lay in ruins. London had endured the relentless bombardment of the Blitz. The time had come to rebuild a home fit for heroes who were returning needing new houses and new jobs. Men were coming back who'd been trained to kill and who'd seen and done awful things. The society was grappling with the challenge of reintegrating them into a country forever changed. Adolf Hitler had committed suicide on April 30th, 1945, and victory in Europe Day finally arrived on the 8th of May. Crowds gathered across London in joyous mood to see King George VI on the balcony of Buckingham Palace and Winston Churchill waving from Whitehall. Even the future Queen Elizabeth II joined in the festivities as she was allowed to wander incognito through the jubilant crowds. And just as the young Elizabeth would take on the role normally held by a man, so too did many other women at this time. More women are coming into industry every day and much more varied other jobs. Indeed, today, women are tackling jobs that were thought impossible a few years ago. Women's role in World War II was to replace men who had actually gone to war, which, of course, caused a problem at the end of the war when men came back expecting to take on the, the jobs that the women had been successfully doing uh, for several years. It was the women who actually built Waterloo Bridge, and they were engaged in that heavy labor. They were replacing the men who were away at war. But the country was now ready to return to peacetime after the most deadly conflict in human history. 1946 saw the London victory celebrations with military parades marching through the city and a nighttime fireworks display. But amongst all the cheer, some very dangerous individuals were lurking, and the burgeoning British press had plenty of sensational stories to report on. Really, the early 20th century, it started to accelerate after W.T. Stead started to expose scandals and things like that. It opened the newspapers much more to murder, and especially after the Second World War, because the British public became very desensitized to horror, because they were used to seeing bombed out sites, dead bodies. So murder became much more palatable to the British public. And of course, Fleet Street always mirrored what people wanted. The Kings of the Crime Reporters were a group called the Murder Gang. People like Norman Jock Ray of the News of the World, Harry Proctor of the Sunday Pictorial, later the Daily Mail, Duncan Webb, and they had enormous power. They were mini celebrities. Some of them were interviewed for the Picture Post and things like that, and they became like household names. 
It must have been a relief for most of the returning soldiers to now be reading the newspapers rather than living with the fear of death every day on the battlefield. One serviceman, though, was returning to London, bringing all the savagery of the fighting with him. This man's charming exterior hid a dark and murderous psyche. Now, I've been instructed by your solicitor, Mr. Neal. Why shouldn't I plead guilty? I beg your pardon? Why should I not plead guilty? You have a father and mother both alive. A younger brother too, I believe. Mick. Well then. They keep asking to see me. The warders think I'm cruel for refusing, but I know they'd hate it. I've done enough to them, you see. Who was Neville Heath? Well, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, there were a lot of people who had left the services and who had this sort of military bearing and had had many adventures in the war. Some people talked about their adventures and their exploits, and they were true. A lot of people, perhaps like Neville Heath, had a mysterious background. Heath had a very lower middle class childhood, and he came from a very normal family. There were no major problems or anything. But from a young age, as a teenager, he showed criminal intent and really theft to start with. Growing up, he always dreamed of being a pilot and joined the RAF when he was still a teenager. He always tried to act the consummate gentleman, inflating his background and spending money he didn't have. In order to escape bad debts, he went AWOL from the RAF. It really started because he stole some mess funds while he was in the Air Force. So he went AWOL, really, to not face the music. He wanted the glamour, he wanted the image, because, of course, at that time, servicemen were heroes, but he wasn't really cut out because he was anti-authority. He was really criminally minded from quite a young age. I'd ring for refreshments, but the service here... Oh, that's quite all right. It's not exactly the Savoy. Tell me about your first court martial in 37. No, thank you. You sure? Get all the smokes I need. Be pretty browned off if I didn't. You were dismissed from the service, were you not? The old buffers. It was a lark. A lark? <sighs> Flew my plane under a bridge. Really? Goodness. It was a damn tricky thing, actually. Even to attempt it, you have to have real skill. I mean, be a real pilot. My superiors weren't so keen, of course. No, I imagine not. It was jolly good fun, though, mind you. <laughs> Neville Heath went on to have a lot more fun as he began a career as a petty criminal. But time after time, his golden looks and charm helped win over the authorities. He seemed with a ready excuse and the promise of future good behavior, Heath could wriggle out of anything. He had all the wartime glamour, the blonde hair. He had the manner of a dashing pilot, a, a hero. He had that glamorous aura which attracted a lot of women. He was somebody who used his appearance enormously. He was blue-eyed, square-jawed, dark blonde haired uh, cleft-chinned, you know, the kind of Cary Grant thing, but with blonde hair. And he was also very elegant and very confident. And this is how he managed to hoodwink so many people. 
He was a con man on quite a grand scale. I mean, the number of names he uses is Major Rupert Brooke, or else he's won the Military Cross. They're all facades behind which he can exploit a number of frauds. The Heath and fraud are, are, are linked all the way through his career. But his luck ran out, and he was sentenced to time in Borstal, an old-fashioned type of correctional facility designed to reform delinquent youth. Unlike most, he thrived in the environment. It wasn't so bad, I suppose. I could still get my daily telegraph. It was rather like being back at school. Housemasters and prefects and all the rest. I understand the governor grew quite attached to you. Well, Jack Joyce, yes. Well, he was a good sort. He supported your application to the Air Force in 39, didn't he? Yes, well... I was house captain, you know. Keeping all those receptions in line. Those were the novice, the new boys. I tell them, no cursing, no brawling, no acting the goat, not when I'm around. That were some real swines, but they knew where they were at with me. Then, of course, the war came. Yes. You tried to re-enlist and the Air Force rejected you. Bloody ministry bureaucrats did. Such pull, you think, outbreak of the war. This great battle approaching. They'd need all the good pilots they had, but no. No. They were up there and I was down here. One of their best pilots, packed and ready. God, it was maddening. It's a damn miracle we won that war. Heath would eventually achieve his ambition and make his way into a cockpit after a truly remarkable journey across the globe. But by the time he finally returned home at the end of the war, he had transformed into a truly vicious individual. No one was safe while Neville Heath was allowed to roam free. Neville Heath had dreams of flying with the Royal Air Force, but those dreams had been dashed due to his troubling behavior. In September 1939, World War II had broken out, but Heath was rejected by the RAF yet again. He joined the far less glamorous Royal Army Service Corps as a private instead. He was stationed in the Middle East, but was soon court-martialed for the second time in his life and sent home in disgrace aboard the SS Maltoon. But when the ship docked in South Africa, Heath seized his chance and escaped. The country offered him a new beginning. He eventually volunteered for the South African Air Force under the typically grand name of James Robert Cadogan Armstrong. Neville Heath had a very checkered military career. He was court-martialed three times for using checks, defaulting on payments, misuse of uniforms and medals. So there was this mix of glamour and fraud throughout his career. It was really in South Africa where he started to show his future modus operandi, and he posed as numerous people there. His first persona was Captain Selway, MC, Military Cross, and he would really inhabit the role. He had a limp, he had an eyeglass. He was really an actor. Heath's acting skills had worked well for him in South Africa. He even achieved his ambition of flying missions during the war, but his true identity was soon revealed, and in January 1946, he was deported back to England. On his return to the UK, he saw one glimmer of hope, the London School of Air Navigation. He intended to become a commercial pilot. He studied hard and excelled, passing all the exams required for his license, but then his previous mistakes ensnared him once again. His court-martial and dismissal from the RAF was discovered. Heath was told he could not become a commercial pilot. I've made a few slips in life, yes, all chaps have. But the Air Ministry refused to let me forge ahead. There's no reasoning with them, none at all. These congenital idiots. I swear, that's what led to all this. 
I worked damn hard for that license. And after that, what did you do after their refusal? I just drifted around for a fortnight or so. Until the 20th. Heath hid the failure from his parents. The only things he had left now, the only things he was good at, were drinking and womanizing. He would pursue them both in an increasingly extreme manner. And it would prove deadly for one Marjorie Gardner. She'd been born to a good middle-class family in Sheffield, but was now living in London. She was a talented artist, but always struggled for money after being separated from her unreliable husband. She was now in an on-off relationship with an alcoholic. She worked as a film extra from time to time. She said to have something of a bohemian lifestyle. Her life went into a spiral, and she was really at the mercy of men she met. She clearly enjoyed the new freedoms offered to women by the war and was drawn to the bright lights of the city. You might call her a good time girl, but she certainly wasn't a prostitute. We left the pub at about eight, I suppose, and then went on to the Normandy for dinner. Do you know it? It's in Knightsbridge. I'm afraid not. We must have left at about half past nine, maybe 10 o'clock. Then we took a cab to the Panama Club. I am a member there. We sat down, just the two of us, and had a few drinks. We must have left at about 20 past midnight. And returned to the Pembridge Court Hotel. Someday we'll build a home on a hilltop high. You and I, shiny and new, a cottage that two can tell. Do you remember anything of what occurred in the room? No. Nothing at all? I woke up and she was lying there. I don't remember anything else. I've already told you all this. You know exactly what happened. Heath may have claimed he was unable to remember what happened with Marjorie Gardner in room four of the Pembridge Court Hotel. But her body told the truth of what horrors had occurred. The post-mortem was performed by noted pathologist Keith Simpson. It showed that Marjorie had been the victim of a savage attack. She'd been bound and probably gagged. Seventeen whip lacerations were found on her body and bruising showed she'd been punched in the face at least twice. Given the extent of her other injuries, we must hope that these blows knocked her out because she was then subjected to the most horrifically violent and sadistic sexual attack. Her suffering was eventually ended by suffocation, probably with a pillow. It was extremely violent, a brutal, frenzied attack. She had lacerations, she'd been lashed with a whip. From a police point of view, one of the interesting things was that there were wheels across her back. And these marks or scars had a peculiar diamond pattern. 
And when the pathologist was discussing the case with the detective, he said, if you can find that weapon, then you'll have your man. Neville Heath would prove a difficult man to track down, though, given his extensive experience of traveling under multiple aliases. Numerous women would cross his path as he made his way around the country. One of them would meet a gruesome end. In 1946, Neville Heath had returned home to England after years abroad during the course of World War II. He had brought back all the savagery of the conflict with him when he murdered Marjorie Gardner at the Pembridge Court Hotel. But Marjorie hadn't been the only woman he brought back to his room. Just four days earlier, he'd stayed there with Yvonne Simmons, who'd been part of the war effort, just like Heath. She was staying in London at the Overseas Club. She met Neville Heath probably impressed by this military bearing, and he put himself over as a, as a lieutenant colonel. He took her out to dinner and persuaded her to come back to the hotel room. They spent the night in the hotel room with nothing of a violent action occurring at all. Heath had seen his new fiancée, Yvonne Simmons, off on the train back to her parents in Worthing after they spent the night together at his hotel. She was a pretty thing. Tall, slender. I think London rather dazzled her. You know, these small-town girls. Not quite as you do, I imagine. You're all from London, though, aren't you? Wimbledon. Oh, my parents live there. Cambridge man. Oxford. I always cheer the other lot during the boat race, I'm afraid. I fancy you're a bit of a rower, though. College late, athletics too for the university. Truly? Yes, a long jumper a long time ago. <laughs> I don't foresee much long jumping in my future either. Short dropping, perhaps. Not if I have anything to say about that, Mr. Heath. <laughs> The morning after he murdered Marjorie Gardner, Heath was on the run. The police would soon be on his tail, though, as he had signed into the hotel under his real name. He was traveling to Worthing to see Yvonne and her family. The amorous young man charmed her parents at the local golf club and then whisked her off to a dinner dance. The charming, war hero, charismatic facade showed no hint of the callous killer beneath. But events were playing on his mind, and after more drinks at a club after dinner, he told Yvonne a terrible secret. There had been a murder in the room they'd shared at Pembridge Court, he said. A woman had been killed. Heath was doing everything to not tell Yvonne that he was with another woman. So he said he met a man who asked him for his hotel room key because he wanted to entertain a young woman. And he said he gave him the key. He completely cut himself out of the murder. And he was able to do that, because as well as being a psychopath, Heath was almost definitely a sociopath. The next morning, newspapers were full of police appeals for Neville Heath to come forward. Yvonne and her parents were shocked, or he wouldn't be. The hunt began for Heath, and it's at this point Heath does something quite astonishing. He, he writes to the police, giving his name, and saying that he knew Marjorie Gardner, he'd been to the same hotel with, with her, um, but he'd loaned her the key to his room. Heath had then gone back to the hotel later on and found her in the room, and he said that he'd even got the whip with which the injuries had been inflicted on her, and he would actually send this to the police. I think in Heath's delusional mind, because he spent so many years um, telling lies and being believed, I think he honestly thought that the police might believe him. I honestly do think that. I think that he thought his version might be accepted. This letter may seem strange, but Heath had form for this kind of thing. 
Often, when committing crimes or indiscretions, he'd written these crawlingly exculpating letters afterwards. These strange common courtesies often seemed to help him get away with things, but it wouldn't help him this time. The police pressed on with their investigation. Meanwhile, Heath was having fun. Unbeknownst to police, on the evening of Sunday the 23rd of June, Heath had arrived at the Tollard Royal Hotel in Bournemouth. He signed the register under the name Rupert Robert Brooke and told the receptionist he would be staying a week. Thank you. By now, the police had tracked Heath as far as Worthing. There, they interviewed the manager at the Ocean Hotel, as well as Yvonne Simmons and her parents. But beyond Worthing, however, the trail was going cold. The Tollard Royal Hotel, where Heath checked in under this false name, Group Captain Brook, was situated overlooking the beach. It's a smart hotel for the better sort. Just Heath's kind of place. He met Peggy Waring in Bournemouth. She was a young woman that Heath was chasing. And he actually proposed to her at one point, but she refused. And there was really a cat and mouse game going on between them. She was playing hard to get. She, she found him attractive, but there's something about him she didn't quite trust. Um, but they did meet several times in Bournemouth and they sent each other letters as well. So for about 13 days, Heath was on the loose and there was no public identification of him. It's this point he meets a young girl called Doreen Marshall. She's 21. Doreen had survived a terrible V1 rocket attack that had reduced most of her street to rubble and killed 13 people. While her family escaped with their lives, the trauma left its mark on young Doreen, a burst of grey hair at her right temple. East version is that he was out walking in Bournemouth. He met Doreen Marshall and her friend, and then he struck up a conversation with them, and he arranged to meet Doreen later. She seemed to have liked him at first, but as she was becoming increasingly anxious because his behaviour was becoming very pushy, very pushy. And the night porter of the Tollard Royal Hotel, where, they, um, where he was staying, witnessed her becoming a little bit panicky. This would sadly be the last time anyone but Heath saw Doreen alive. I have no recollection of going near the chine. Next thing I remember, I was lighting a cigarette. As I went to flick the match away, I saw blood on my hands. I'd left the hotel with her. I knew that. But where she was, or what happened, I was on the beach, on the sand. How late it was, I don't know. I didn't know what to do. I washed my hands in the sea and then walked back along the beach to the hotel. It was quiet. There was nobody about. I knew something dreadful had happened. Doreen Marshall's sudden disappearance raised suspicions about the mysterious character of Rupert Brooke, who'd only just arrived in Bournemouth. The police, who were hunting for the killer of Marjorie Gardner, would soon realize that Neville Heath and Rupert Brooke were one and the same. 
When Heath was finally captured, his extraordinary and frightening life story would be revealed to both his legal counsel and a fascinated public who were fed all the details by the burgeoning British press. Neville Heath was staying at the Tollard Royal Hotel in Bournemouth under the false name Captain Rupert Brooke. Doreen Marshall was at the hotel lounge as well, but she was now missing. Captain Brooke. When Heath went back to the hotel that night, he used a ladder get into his hotel room. And when the porter came up to check, they saw his shoes there. And at breakfast the following morning, he told everybody that he'd played this prank on the doorman. But in fact, that created an alibi in his mind over what he had done and how he had attacked Doreen Marshall. Fears over Doreen Marshall's disappearance were growing. And on Friday the 5th of July, the manager at the Tollard Royal Hotel received a telephone call from his counterpart in town at the Norfolk Hotel, where Doreen had been staying. She had last been seen in a taxi heading for the Tollard Royal. The hotel staff at Bournemouth were very concerned about Neville Heath or Group Captain Brooke as he had signed himself in, in the register under. And because they knew that Doreen Marshall was missing, they knew that Heath had had some connection with her. They said, well, you, you really should go to the police, which indeed he did do. The man police believed was Group Captain Brooke seemed a helpful witness, calm, courteous, and upfront nothing to hide, there was no reason to detain him, nor any reason to think there was anything wrong with Doreen's disappearance. She was on holiday after all, and might have made an impromptu trip. She was expected to show up eventually, but a certain resemblance was nagging at their memory. Detective Constable Salter actually had the photograph of Neville Heath, which had been circulated to the police forces, and said, well, actually, we want you to stay here just to, to check for a bit longer until um, my detective inspector comes. The Bournemouth police were under pressure to release the man, though. Wasn't he a gentleman, an honest serviceman who'd given his word? Their superiors wanted him freed, but D.I. Gates couldn't shake the conviction that this was the man the entire country was looking for. All they had to do was delay long enough till the information came through. But Group Captain Brooke had already given them a bit of information they could look into. He had told the police he was from an aerodrome in Leicester. He even gave them the name of his chief, a man called Walters, well, this was something they could look into right away. Eventually, Red Spooner from Scotland Yard came down and they identified Neville Heath as the man they wanted to interview and arrested him for the murder of Marjorie Gardner. In the course of searching Neville Heath, they found a number of things. One was a rail ticket that Doreen Marshall had used. Another in his luggage was the whip and some blood-stained clothing, and there was some hair on the whip that corresponded with Marjorie Gardner. And so it was very clear at that stage that Neville Heath was, was clearly connected and had possession 
of the murder weapon. Spooner charged Heath with the murder of Marjorie Gardner. There was still, though, no sign of Doreen. It was the coverage of Heath's arrest in the press that helped lead to the discovery of the body of Doreen Marshall. A young waitress named Kathleen Evans thought she was just taking her dog for a walk. But the next day, when she read the papers, her mind went back to the strange swarm of flies she had encountered. She revisited the location with her father. They discovered the clothing and informed the police. Doreen's body was soon found. It was found concealed in some bracken. She'd been stripped naked, her hands tied behind her back. She'd been savagely beaten. Heath had almost certainly stripped himself naked before the attack because there was so much blood. Then having committed the attack, he'd gone into the sea, washed himself, and got rid of, got rid of the knife. Charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardner, Heath's trial began on the 24th of September, 1946. This wasn't his first appearance at the Old Bailey. It was here in 1938 that he'd been sentenced for robbery. But these charges were on an entirely different scale. Why should I not plead guilty? Mr. Heath, there is no kindness to your family in throwing your life away. A guilty plea is accepting that you were in your right mind when these murders were committed. Do you want it to be said that your parents raised a man to commit such crimes? Is that how you want Mick to think of you, and he to think himself as a child of the same parents? Mick's different. He knows better. But it's only human to wonder, is it not, what he too might be capable of. This is your opportunity, your one opportunity, to prove to Mick and your parents that the man who committed these vile murders is not the real Neville Heath they know. That would be a true kindness. All right? Put me down as not guilty, old boy. Heath's counsel, J.D. Caswell, had developed a reputation for handling infamous murder cases that generated a lot of press attention at the time, but nothing quite like the story of the lady killer, Neville Heath. I think the way the press covered Heath was wrong. I know for a fact that circulation of the Sunday Pictoria increased by about 40%. There was a massive interest in Heath, and it certainly increased Harry Proctor's stock in Fleet Street. Proctor really got a nitty gritty of his story from prison. You know, he spent time with him in prison, he spoke to him, so he got the exclusive. And Heath was very much shown as a lady killer in the jaunty way of that word. He was dashing, you know, he was the airman. He was almost seen like a Terry Thomas type character. But the problem is what he did was monstrous. With the evidence against Heath so overwhelming, his defense did not deny that he was the killer. Instead, they claimed the murders were proof of insanity. They did not hide Heath's previous wrongdoings. Instead, they revealed them in court, arguing the crimes were steadily escalating ones, a progressive mania that finally led to murder. 
I think he was faced with a situation that a lot of murderers would have faced, that actually they were facing the death penalty if they were convicted. If they could prove um, insanity in some form, um, then actually they stood a lot better chance of being reprieved. You might think he was insane, but the thing is, in legal terms, he wasn't insane under the Monotone rules, which states that you have to not know what you're doing is wrong at the moment of death, and that's very difficult to prove. A number of people in his situation did actually try to plead insanity with, you know, a wide variety of, of different success rates. And the problem with Heath was that he made so many efforts to cover up after, you know, after both murders, and he told so many lies, that it showed that he did know what he was doing was legally wrong, if not morally wrong. Will you be calling me to give evidence? I do not think at the current time that that would be our best course of action. Concerned I won't see him mad enough for them, Mr. Caswell. We're not contesting your involvement in the murders. It is a question of your state of mind. And on that, we will, of course, present the jury with expert opinion from the most eminent authorities. Hmm. A doctor has been recommended. He practiced psychotherapy at Broadmoor. I'm arranging for him to visit. He shall want to conduct several interviews with you. Their key witness was Dr. William Henry de Barg Hubert, a specialist in psychiatry. It was a disastrous appearance. He ended up suggesting that all crimes are excusable if the person can't help themselves. Even Heath dismissed his own witness. He passed a note to the defense, insisting he'd never suggested being excused on the grounds of insanity. Indeed, it appeared that at this point, Heath had a death wish. If so, the wish was granted. How do we account for the crimes of Neville Heath? His life had always been one of lies and scams, but somehow, whatever the scrape, he always managed to wriggle free. After the war, though, he became a deeply twisted and vicious individual. But he maintained his playboy facade to the very end. When he was offered the customary glass of whiskey to settle his nerves before execution, he calmly replied, under the circumstances, you might make that a double.